Clausewitz, in other words, began to consider the conundrum confronted by First World War journalists. Given the tactical conditions of modern battle, how could battle be used for strategic defense? Clausewitz acknowledged that where the strategic defense rests on secure flanks, there can be no conversion to attack. It is even more awkwardly limited where the attack has to be convergent, he wrote. And here he went on to have another insight that is directly relevant to the First World War. Russia and France, he wrote, cannot attack Germany in any other way than by conversion movements, because obviously they're either side of Germany. They can never attack with united forces. So for Germany, given Germany's strategic position in the First World War, that is, being in the central position within Europe, being able to operate on what strategic theories today would call interior and interior lines, that is to say, to be able to move troops easily and quickly from the Eastern Front to the Western Front, given their possession of the strategic position, understood and expressed clearly enough by Clausewitz. And given the fact that Clausewitz explained the inherent defensive advantages which such a country would enjoy, the challenge for Germany was how to produce a positive result when all the strengths that enhanced strategically in the First World War resided in the defensive, as Clausewitz understood it, which Clausewitz also described as the negative form of warfare. Clausewitz tackled this problem in Book One of On War, in Chapter Two, where he acknowledged the pure self-defense, fighting only for the purpose of resistance and for no greater objectives, conferred the greatest relative advantage in war. This, the negative aim, was, he argued, the natural means to outlast the enemy. But that also implied that the defender could achieve only a limited outcome. If the negative aim that is, the use of every means available for pure resistance, gives an advantage in war. The advantage is only be enough to balance any superiority the enemy opponent may possess. In the end, his political objective will not seem worth the effort it costs. He must then renounce his policy. So for Germany in the First World War, the logical conclusion to the sorts of arguments produced by Clausewitz should have been a negotiated peace settlement. The policy would then have been congruent with the character of the war. The end of the war would then have been adapted to the means. But as ever in Clausewitz, nothing is ever quite so neat or unequivocal. And to every proposition, he produces a counter. And in this case, it comes at the other end of on war in Book 8 where Clausewitz addressed the pursuit of the limited aim in a defensive war. And he says, no doubt, in theory, you could pursue a war where you simply aim to wear the enemy down. The enemy has the positive aim, and any successful operation, even though it only costs the forces that take part in it, has the same effect as a retreat. But the defender's loss has not occurred in vain. He has held his ground, which is all he meant to do. For the defender, then, it might be said, his positive aim is to hold what he has. That might be sound if it were sure that a certain number of attacks would actually wear the enemy down and make him persist. But this is not necessarily so. If we consider the relative exhaustion of forces on both sides, the defender is at a disadvantage. The attack may weaken, but only in the sense that the turning point may occur. Once that possibility is gone, the defender weakens more than the attacker for two reasons. For one thing, he is weaker anyway, and if losses are the same on both sides, it is he who is harder hit. Second, the enemy will usually deprive him of part of his territory and resources. In all this, we can find no reason for the attacker to persist. We are left with the conclusion that if the attacker sustains his efforts while his opponent does nothing but ward them off, the latter can do nothing to neutralize the danger that sooner or later an offensive, an offensive thrust will succeed. Certainly the exhaustion, or to be accurate, the fatigue of the stronger has often brought about peace. The reason can be found in the half-hearted manner in which wars are usually waged. It cannot be taken in any scientific sense 
as the ultimate universal objective of all events. In other words, Clausewitz's conclusion was both stark and surprisingly the Germans of the First World War upbeat. <coughs> he ended up by saying, a major victory can only be obtained by positive measures aimed at a decision, never by simply waiting on events. In short, even in the defense, a major state alone can bring a major gain. So the key question for Germany in the First World War was how far its political aspirations should be brought into conformity with the character of the war. If the war was attritional and offensive, it seemed as though Germany was modifying its war aims. It must align its policy with tactical reality. But if, as Clausewitz suggested in Book 8, the defensive was simply a phase adopted by the weaker belligerents as a temporary measure, then there was no reason for Germany not to continue to hope that it was simply the preliminary to the achievement of greater objectives. Now in Germany, before the war, it had become increasingly fashionable to see Clausewitz as a philosopher. This was not only a way of accounting for his lack of dogma and for the complexity of his prose, but it also made sense of his use of the dialectic as a way of promoting understanding. <coughs> Paul Kreutzinger, who had written a three-part work on war in the decade before the First World War, also published a study of Hegel's influence on Clausewitz in 1911. And in 1915, Kreutzinger produced a fresh edition of On War, to which he contributed a foreword. This was an edition, the 1915 edition, which as well as reprinting Schlieffen's Memorandum of 1905, was also preceded by endorsements from 11 generals then commanding in war. 